Welcome to East Lake Church. My name is Kevin McPeak, and I'm one of the pastors here. I'm so happy that you are joining us for week one of this brand new series called Secrets, where we're looking at these secrets that we kind of keep, and they can really create some problems in our lives. I'm going to start by actually confessing a secret to all of you. And uh, the secret is nothing scandalous, it's nothing criminal, uh, but it is, believe it or not, something that I'm embarrassed about from my life to the point that I've actually not shared this story in public before this weekend. I maybe have told a couple of friends this story before, but uh, it embarrasses me enough that I've actually kept it secret. And here's, here's the deal. Um, my freshman year of college, a couple of years ago, don't try to figure out how many. If you want to guess, just go with five. So freshman year of college, uh, I was a music major at the University of Miami, the U, and uh, a couple of my buddies called me up. And they said, hey, we just got hired to play on a cruise ship for the weekend. It's called the Symphony on the Sea. And what we're going to do is we're going to play percussion for this orchestral, this, this concert they're going to do on Sunday night. And it's totally free. All expenses paid. And guess what? They need a bass player. And I was like, hey, I'm a bass player. That sounds kind of fun. I've never been on a cruise ship before. So I get myself on the gig. So I'm pretty excited about this. And all we have to do is go to a rehearsal on Sunday afternoon and then do the concert on Sunday night. So Friday, we get on the boat and we do exactly what you would expect a group of undergraduate males to do on the boat, which is make a lot of trouble, stay up too late, make a lot of noise, just be basically nuisances. And we're having an absolute blast. Well, Sunday afternoon rolls around, it's time for the rehearsal. And I get to the rehearsal and I'm looking around and I realize oh, I'm, I'm the only upright bassist on this gig. Uh, wow, I'm going to have to hold down all the parts by myself. Um, so that's going to be a challenge to, for me to do. Oh, I, f I forgot an important detail. I can't believe I forgot to tell you this. Um, I don't play the upright bass. So you can imagine the complication that this creates. I've been hired to do a gig to play the upright bass. I don't play the upright bass. I thought there would be other people there. And I'm an electric bassist, and it's kind of similar, and I thought maybe I could fake my way through and just hide behind the other people that were playing bass, but I'm it. So about 30 seconds into the rehearsal, there's this truth that's dawning on everyone in the room, which is that I don't know how to play the bass. And the conductor, who's a very well-respected musician, stops the rehearsal, and he points to me, and I still remember what he looks like. We actually have a photo of it for you. And he looked at me. <laughs> he looked at me, and he said, bassist, I'd like to hear your part alone, please. Oh, yeah, that gasp I just heard? Imagine that times a million. That's how I felt. And at that moment, I think I was the only person in history who had ever prayed, dear God, please let there have been an iceberg that broke free from Greenland and somehow made it outside the Bahamas and is right in front of the ship right now so that we can sink to the bottom of the ocean rather than me have to play alone in front of everyone because I can't play. Unfortunately, there was no iceberg there, so I mustered up all of the musicianship I had and I began to play. And you know what happened? Bad things, man. <laughs> Bad, bad things. It was a crime against music, what I did. And the conductor, who had not taken his eyes off of me, he was the only one who would look at me at this point, because every other musician in the room was disgusted that I had fraudulently faked my way on this gig. They looked at me like I was a fraud, and you know why they did that? Because I was a fraud. That's why. Those things go hand in hand sometimes. And the conductor looked at me, and he said, you would have been better off practicing instead of doing whatever it was you've been doing over these past two days. And I was thinking, oh, I, I don't think two days would have fixed it. Um, I think the problems go far deeper than, than you think they do, sir. But the, the truth is that he was right. I would have been better doing something different, but not practicing for two days. It would have been better being honest up front and going, I don't know how to do this. I would have been better off being honest and not borrowing an upright bass from a guy I knew at college and pretending I knew how to play it. I was humiliated. And you know what? I should have been. I should have been. And I'm still embarrassed by that story. And the reason I am so reluctant to tell people that story is because 
I'm ashamed that I did that. You see, I presented myself as something I wasn't. I pretended to be something I'm not, and that really lacks integrity. And it bugs me to this day that I do that. It still gives me like a pit in my stomach to think about that story, to think that I actually did that. See, there's two parts of that story, really. The first part is that I kept secret the fact that I didn't know what I was doing. And the second part is that I keep it secret now because I'm embarrassed and I'm ashamed. See, we've all got secrets. We've all got different kinds of secrets. We've got different levels of secrets. And, and when, I, when I talk about this secret, honestly, it's not really that significant. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, nobody got injured. Nobody was harmed except for my pride. But it didn't really hurt anybody's life. We keep secrets like this, and it's really the first type of secret that we look at today. And, and this type of secret is just, it's a silly kind of secret. It's not significant. This is the first type of secret, and it's honestly the, the least important of all the secrets that we keep. When you don't tell somebody about a surprise party that's coming up, or you don't tell somebody about a gift that you're, you're going to get them, well, you know, it's kind of silly, right? It's no big deal. But those aren't the important ones. There are other kinds of secrets that are much more significant. One of them is this, the sinful secret. See, these are the secrets that we keep because we know we did something wrong. Maybe we did that in the past, or maybe we're doing that wrong thing right now, and we start to keep it secret. We conceal the truth, but all that does is kind of plant poison in our lives. See, in this, in this series, what we're going to do is look at a story that's all about a sinful secret, because that's where most of us get ourselves in trouble. That's where we hurt other people, we hurt ourselves, and we hurt our relationship with God. But there is one other kind of secret that I want to talk about for a moment before we get into our story, and that secret is this, the shaming secret. I, I wanna be super clear about this. There are kinds of secrets that are way too significant to be called silly, but they aren't secrets that we keep because we did something bad to someone else. See, there's this third kind of secret. We call it a shaming secret because most often, it's something that was done to us, and it hurts us, it pains us, it brings us shame or it brings us pain to bring up these stories in front, of, in front of other people. And so we keep them to ourselves. And oftentimes, sinful secrets and shaming secrets get confused with each other because someone's sinful secret, a, a bad thing they did to someone else, often becomes this other person's shaming secret, the thing that was done to them that they're uncomfortable speaking about, about in, in any way. And although in this series we're gonna look at a story that's about a sinful secret, somebody doing something wrong. It, I think it's really important that we say, if you've been the victim of someone else's sinful secret and you've kept the hurt and the pain to yourself, you've kept that a secret because of the pain and the shame, what happened to you is not your fault. What happened to you is not something that you should feel blame for. A lot of us carry these secrets about stuff that was done to us. Maybe it's something that happened to you when you were a kid. Maybe it was something that just happened to you. And you keep it locked down because it's so painful. You don't need to be ashamed. You don't need to be afraid of getting that out in the open and getting that before God. You know why? Because it was not your fault. And as we talk about these secrets, it's really important to set that kind aside and understand you, you bear no blame for those things that were done to you through no act or decision of yours. Please know that this is a church where that's, that's totally safe. Okay, you are loved here, you are welcomed here, regardless of what has happened to you. And I wanna go back to our story where we talk about this, this other kind of secret, this sinful secret, where someone actually engages in actions that they shouldn't. The story is about a guy named King David. If you're familiar with the Bible, uh, David was a king in Israel and Judah about a thousand years before the birth of Jesus. And if you're familiar at all with the stories of the Bible, you might know about David and Goliath. David was, was a boy in that story and he grew up eventually to be the king of this area. So here's the story, David is in Jerusalem. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David, remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. 
And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Now, she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. There's a lot happening in five verses in that story. And it shows us this slide into secrecy that happens when we do what we know is wrong and then we try to hide it. Here's the progression of David's slide. The first thing is this, David compromised his values. He, he started to sacrifice what he knew was the right thing to do instead of just doing the right thing. It says this in the verse, in the spring at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. But David remained in Jerusalem. At first off, that opening is kind of hilarious. In the spring when kings go to war, you know, like that's just what you do. Hey, it's springtime. That's a beautiful day. Oh, the flowers are coming out. We should go kill some guys, right? That's a, just a weird kind of rhythm of life to have that you begin spring by going to war. But David, the king, sends his troops off. And you'll note the scripture said when kings go to war. Well, he's the king, but he's not going. See, David has already compromised the value of leadership. He knows he's supposed to go. He knows he's supposed to be with the soldiers. He sent Joab, his right-hand man, to go command the troops. I'm just going to hang back here in Jerusalem where it's comfortable. And that's not the way leaders are to lead. David has already begun to let his values slip, and it's evident in the beginning of this story. Other parts of Scripture earlier tell us that David had done other things that he shouldn't have done. He had taken on multiple wives and concubines, which is a, a fancy word for basically mistresses that had a lower social stand, standing than, than a wife. But he began to compromise some of, these, some of these things that he knew he shouldn't do. And you know what? That's what we do too. That's what I do. I start to let little things slide instead of making sure that I've, I, I've got integrity in every area. And I, and I start to compromise little values. And that's where you start the slide to doing the bigger things wrong. See, we get immune because we get used to doing stuff we know we shouldn't do. The second thing that happened was David gave in to desire. You, you see, the story escalates pretty quickly in this next verse. Once David was already compromising these other things that he knew he should be doing, it was easy to start compromising on bigger things. We go back to the story. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. That's quite a moment in the story. David's just walking around on the roof. Hey, it's a nice night in Jerusalem. He's checking things out. Hey, whoa! That is a naked woman in a bathtub. Okay. Well, I probably shouldn't look at that. Right? That's the thing that happens to so many of us. We see the thing we shouldn't see. We do the thing we shouldn't do, and then we linger. We take the second look, we take the third look, we take the fourth look, we take the fifth look, and that's the path that leads to death. See, what we've got to do is understand, you're going you're to bump into stuff, and you've got to have the wisdom to go, it's not for me, right? And get yourself out of there. Friends, let me tell you something super clear. If you have the expectation that by following Jesus, you're not going to have desires that are going to get you in trouble, I want to set you straight on that. You're still going to have temptations. That's always going to be present. What you've got to do is rely on the wisdom to know better. You've got to rely on the wisdom to flee those situations. Because here's, here's kind of what it's like. This is, this is the metaphor I'd give you. Is we kind of swim through life like little fish. And every once in a while we see this little worm out there. And I know it sounds delicious, but for a, for a fish, you know. They, they go and they swim up and they take a little, little nibble from that worm. And you know the problem? There's a hook in there. And then you're hooked. And then you get reeled into something you never wanted to do in the first place. And some of these temptations we see, they, oh, they look good from the outside. But then you take a bite and you're hooked. My advice to you when you see that stuff is swim away, Nemo. Swim away. Because <laughs> it's trouble. My wife and I have met with so many couples and so many, honestly, I've met with so many guys individually who have thrashed their marriages. And when you sit down and talk with people in that situation 
And maybe you've been in that situation. You go, man, I never set out to destroy my marriage. I never intended to wreck things. I, I don't know how I got to this point. You know, nobody ever comes in and goes, you know, I made this decision. I was just gonna do something really stupid and blow everything up. Nobody ever says that to me. They go, I don't know how I got here. Well, the way you get here is you start sliding over here and you give in on the little things again and again and again. And you know where it happens is when we get complacent. In, in marriage, I think some of you will know what I'm talking about where you get complacent. Um, I call it the sweatpants zone, you know? <laughs> where you come home and it's been a long day and you're tired and you just want to relax and so you just kind of want to put your feet up. So you put on the sweatpants. Maybe you put on that like affliction t-shirt you bought in 2007 that's kind of ratty now. You know exactly what I'm talking about because all of you have like those clothes, right? And you just want to relax. You just want to chill and that's fine. But the danger is then we, you know, we go to work and we got to dress up a little nicer. You know, got to fix the hair. Put on some cologne, smell a little better. Or you go out with your friends and you put yourself together all right. And then you're going, you're walking around and you see someone and someone sees you and there's a like zap moment, right? A little bit of electricity. You're like, ooh, who's that? And you're like, hey, I still got it, right? That's kind of fun to think you still got it. You know? That's what I've heard. Um, <laughs> Some of you can relate to that. Others of us never had it. But you know what I mean? Like there's just that, ooh, yeah. I still, I still have it going. And then there's the excitement of pursuit. And there's the, all of that that goes into it. And, sh- and before you know it, you got a hook in your mouth. You're in trouble. And it's all because we get complacent. I'm gonna give you some advice. Okay, if you're married and you experience that little zap spark with somebody that isn't your spouse, Run in the other direction. I'm telling you right now, I'm not kidding. And if you do that, here's, here's the worry that some people have. Well, I don't want to seem rude. Oh, you're not willing to pay that price? I'm being serious. Like, I've been in situations where I've come across as a little awkward or a little rude because I wanted to avoid something. Now, part of that might be because I'm naturally awkward and a little rude, but <laughs> the point is, I'm willing to to pay that price in order to protect my marriage. See, I'd rather stay good with my wife than worry about somebody else's feelings. Now, it doesn't mean I'm going to be cruel to somebody, but if if there's anything that I feel like, ooh, this is probably not good, I say, hey, see you later, and I'm just going to head in the opposite direction because I don't need that kind of trouble because here's what happens. Sin is always going to take you further than you want to go. It's going to keep you there longer than you want to stay, and it's going to cost you more than you want to pay, and you don't want to do that. See, every one of us has made a bad choice at least once in the past. And we've done dumb things. We've got a choice, though. We can either continue to make bad decisions and bad choices, or we can pivot and start to make new, better decisions. Ephesians says it in a much wiser and more eloquent way than I ever could. It says this, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, the next thing that happens in our story is where things escalate very quickly. What happens here is David sacrificed his integrity. David could have realized this is a bad idea. He could have come to his senses. He could have like I don't know, taking a cold shower, played Jenga, whatever, run in the opposite direction. But he didn't. Look what he did. David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Think about this. David is the king. He has the most power of anyone. And while his soldiers are out at war, what's he using his power for? to find out about some lady that isn't his wife. And then this this servant that he sends out comes back with information about her. And the information is, hey, she's the daughter of Eliam. Now, David would have known, and if you read elsewhere in scripture, that name would mean something to David. Eliam had been one of David's mighty men. It means he had been a soldier on behalf of David in the past. That's that guy's daughter. And she's the wife of Uriah, who is currently one of David's soldiers. David would know that. 
This is the daughter of one of my faithful soldiers and the wife of one of my faithful soldiers. And yet, and yet, he again uses his power to send messengers to bring her to the palace so that he can sleep with her. Now, I think it's important here to press pause because there's this other person in the story, Bathsheba. And there's a lot of biblical controversy about, okay, so what's her role in all of this? Because a lot of biblical commentators have said, well, she was a willing participant. And honestly, we don't know. She was bathing on the roof. We don't know if that was the only option. We don't know if that was something she was trying to do to ensnare the king. We don't know. But what we do know is that there's a big power difference between the king and the wife of a soldier. And the pressure and the situation that she would have been in with the king sending a servant to go and get her put her in a very difficult spot. We don't know if she was a willing participant. We don't know if she was a victim. But the bottom line is, it's very difficult to derive any sort of like authoritative interpretation of what her role was in this. But we do know David's. And David has now neglected his responsibility as a king, and he's given into his lust, and he's slept with the wife of a faithful soldier. Basically, he's trashed his integrity and proven that who he claims to be, the good and just king of Judah and Israel, is not who he is. He is a fraud. He's borne false witness against himself. And scripture's clear about what happens when we do that. It says this, a false witness will not go unpunished, and whoever pours out lies will not go free. Now, what's going to happen next, at this point, is probably obviously inevitable, right? David was confronted by the consequences. When we slide into deception and secrecy, there's, there's going to come a day of reckoning. It's inevitable, and it ain't pretty. In this case, it's summed up in a single sentence. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. Think about Bathsheba's situation. She's now pregnant with the child of the king, and her husband is away at war. She's in a difficult situation. How, how are they going to explain all of this? And David himself has basically descended now to the bottom. He's used messengers and servants to do his bidding, and he's used his power and his palace to have his way with a woman that's not his wife. So what's he do? Well, he decides to engage in secrecy and deception to try to solve the problem. But the details of that secrecy and deception are what we're going to talk about next week. So you got to come next week for part two of Secrets. But to preview that, I want to tell you there's some wise words in the book of Numbers that we should heed. It says this, but if you don't do what you say, you will be sinning against God. You can be sure that your sin will track you down. There's another translation of that same verse that says, be sure your sins will find you out. The, one of the biggest lies that secrecy tells us is that we can control the truth. So we can't. The truth is the truth. It's not under your control. We like to think that we can dig this big hole somewhere and we can just throw our secrets in there and we can bury them and then they'll go away. And I guess maybe once in a while that works. But often what happens is those secrets get down there and they start to grow and they get roots that go down and they get sprouts that go up and one day they, they see the light of day. And then we have to face the consequences. Scripture says that with those words, you can be sure that your sin will track you down. And I understand that at this point it can feel, feel a little hopeless. It can feel kind of negative, feel like, okay, great, so glad I came to church today. Be sure your sin will track you down. Have a nice week, right? But that's not where it ends. There is hope. And you can see it in the words of Romans 6. It says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, the scripture tells us we're earning a payment for our sins. We're building up this account as we go along, and then one day we get our paycheck from that account, and the paycheck is death. That's the paycheck we've earned. However, there's hope because instead of that, we can have a solution. That solution is Jesus. That's the solution. That's the cure to the Jesus that we all, that's, the, that's the, the cure for the disease that we all face. See, there's this antidote to secrecy. It's an antidote that heals us, makes us whole, and gives us hope, and that's this. The antidote to secrecy is to walk in the truth. Now, when I say this, 
I'm not saying, hey, the moral of the story is honesty is the best policy because that's just self-help. And, it, you know, honesty is the best policy. That's true, but it's incomplete because if you just always do the right thing and, and live the truth, you're going you're gonna to screw it up at some point and you're going to need Jesus. And it's not just that Jesus is the hope. Jesus is the truth. He described himself as the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is truth personified. Look at his words from uh, John verse eight, uh, chapter eight. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. See, what sets us free from the bondage of our secrets and our past is the truth. And the truth is the person of Jesus. And you might go, okay, okay, but I don't, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to access that. I don't know how to take a step in that direction. Well, here's what you do. In a moment, I'm going to give you a chance to, to begin that relationship with Jesus. I'm going, to, I'm going to pray a prayer, and I would invite you to pray that prayer for yourself. And you might be somebody who goes, hey, I, I started a relationship with Jesus a long time ago, and I, man, I've drifted. I've, I've kind of walked away, and I've, I've kind of started doing stuff I shouldn't do, and I need to come correct. I need to reset with Jesus. Great. You can say that prayer too. Because we can all get that fresh start. Now, I also want to give you a kind of a, a learning to crawl step as we talk about these secrets. As we do this, as we have this prayer, I want to invite you to do something, and that's this. I want you to confess that secret to God. Just put that secret that you're carrying b- before him. I'm not saying, hey, what I want you to do is tell everybody your deepest, darkest secret. Because you know what? That's not always safe. There are people to whom you should not tell your deepest, darkest secret because they can't handle it and you're going to get hurt in the process. You can start the crawl step by confessing it to God. And you can do that right now, today. You can begin that relationship. Let's do that right now by praying. Let's pray. Jesus, today I come before you with all of my hurts, all of my secrets, and all of my sins. I invite you to be the Lord and center of my life and the truth that guides me. I put my life in your hands and I ask you to forgive my sins. Jesus, I have parts of my past that I am ashamed of. I confess all of my past and all of my sins to you. Whether something I did harm somebody else and I need forgiveness or something was done to me by someone else and I just need healing, I give it all to you right now, right here. I ask for you to help me walk in the light of your truth And it's in your name that I pray, amen.